I apologize for the delay. We are having some internet problems, speed problems. Anyway, we are looking at Ephesians 2. I'll read verses 1 to 3 and 11 through 13, in which this particular word is translated as in times past or sometimes. And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or lifestyle in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. I'll go down to verse 11 and 13. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. And then verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus are ye, sometime, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. We can also go to another passage in Ephesians. This is Ephesians 5, verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And likewise, in Colossians 1, 21, this word is rendered as sometime, Colossians 1, 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. And also, let's go to Titus 3, 3 to 7. Titus 3, and I'll read verses 3 to 7. And this is translated sometimes in verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And lastly, we want to go to 1 Peter 2.10. 2, 1 Peter 2, verse 10. And there we read, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, let's turn to the verse that is quoted here in Hebrews 1.5, which is Psalm 2.7, and we want to Consider the first half of this verse in Greek, which is actually made up of the following four words, Thou art my son. And we find these terms, these four terms, used 
at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry when he was baptized by John the Baptist to commence his work on earth. And we can go to Mark 1.11 and also Luke 3.22. So let's go first to Mark 1.11. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Mark 1 11, and there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son. <clears throat> In, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I beg your pardon, <clears throat> in whom I am <clears throat> well pleased. I'll read it again. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's go to Luke 3.22. Luke 3, verse 22. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son. In thee I am well pleased. Well, besides these references, uh, there are some others that are included. Actually, they include the rest of Psalm 2-7, and these are Acts 13-33 and Hebrews 5-5. 5, 5. So let's go there. <clears throat> Acts 13-33. We read there, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And then we can go to Hebrews 5.5. 5. Hebrews 5.5. 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And again, we want to keep in mind that this is looking back at Christ's sacrifice at the foundation of the world. And we went into a lot of detail, actually, regarding Psalm 2-7 and also Acts 13-33 when we were doing some word bridges in BMI series on the Lamb Slain from the Foundation of the World. Uh, but what I'd like to do is to uh, continue in uh, Hebrews 1-5, and we read in the last part, uh, of that verse, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son, which again follows this statement, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And this is noteworthy for at least two reasons. Number one, it reinforces the truth that Jesus was the firstborn or the first begotten from the dead. In other words, he was the first to rise from the dead at the foundation of the world. Everybody else that became saved are like a first fruits of that. They were raised to life in their soul 
And eventually, on the very last day of this prolonged day of judgment, their bodies will be transformed, and those that have died will be resurrected with these glorified spiritual bodies. The other thing is that it also highlights not only the intimate relationship between God the Father and God the Son, but the same relationship that exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the child of God. And uh, we, for example, see language that speaks about God being a father and they shall be my son or my daughter. Uh, for example, we can go to Leviticus 26.12. We find an example of this, Leviticus 26.12. Verse 12, and I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. This is also the case in the New Testament. If we go to 2 Corinthians 6, 18, 2 Corinthians 6, 18, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The same intimate relationship that exists within the members of the Trinity, and including the Bride of Christ, because the bride of Christ is married to her husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is also expressed beautifully in Christ's high priestly prayer that we find in the fourth gospel and in, let's see, chapter 17 of the fourth gospel. And I'll read verses 21 to 23. And this is not only true now, as God uh, uh, indwells his people, but also is something that can we can look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. But notice the, the intimacy here that exists. Verses 21 to 23, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So again, we see this repetition that they may be one as we are one, and that God has given his glory to the elect, and this also is a witness to the world that God has loved his elect from the very foundation of the world, even as he loved his son. We read elsewhere from the foundation of the world. So it's an awesome picture to keep in mind and in light of that, what I'd like to do is, as we go through these verses, verses 4 to 14 in Hebrews 1, is to make a list of these differences between God the Son and the created angels. And the first one that we can put down is that God never addressed any of these angelic beings with the title, Thou art my son, nor with the proclamation, This day have I 
begotten thee. Having to do with Christ rising from the dead after he atoned for the sins of all the elect. And we can add to that that he never articulated a father-son relationship with the angelic beings as he has done with mankind. Because mankind is very unique because they are made in the very image and likeness of God. Now, let's go back to Hebrews 1, verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Once again, we find another contrast between God the Son and the angels. Even though there were, without a doubt, angels proclaiming the glory of God, if you recall, when Jesus was born and the shepherds heard this and they came uh, to find the, the baby Jesus, uh, yet we find the term firstborn or first begotten, and this is Strong's number 4416. This is a very important word. It's prototokos. We do find the angels proclaiming the good news, the heavenly tidings. For example, in Matthew 125, we find this word, expressed here as firstborn, Matthew 125. And this is, I'll start with verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So we see that this word firstborn can refer to Christ taking on a human nature. And however, in spite of that, this is not in, in what, we, what we read in verse 6 is not what this is speaking about, because this has to do with at the foundation of the world, not when Christ took on a human nature. And one thing to keep in mind is the fact that at the foundation, the foundation of the world was just that, the foundation of the world based upon what Christ had accomplished. Uh, in the atonement. And we can think about the term cornerstone, which is a very apt word that God uses. And we understand what a cornerstone is. It's that main stone that marks out how the building is going to be built. And if we go to Job 38, four to seven, we find uh, an excellent example here, Job 38, four to seven, in which God initiates a series of questions that he is giving to Job. Actually, this goes on for a number of chapters, but we'll just look at verses four to seven of Job 38. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together 
And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, it's important to keep in mind, here we have a couple in this passage, a couple different words for foundations. Uh, one is in verse 4. Then we have another one in verse 6. And the one in verse 6 is the one that I'd like to, uh, us to focus on because it also contains the word, there are actually two words, corner, the corner, and stone. And this is significant. This first word uh, the, are the foundations, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened. This word is very interesting because of the fact that it's only translated here as the foundations. It's Strong's number 134. Every other time, it's used exclusively or rendered exclusively as sockets. And so we find that word used in connection with what was taking place in the construction of the tabernacles, because that word is used quite often in various phases of the construction, having to do with various implements, whether it was the candlestick or something else that was being discussed this word socket or sockets comes up very frequently. Now, the, the other interesting thing about it is that this word socket is derived from the root word, which is the word Lord. It's the first three letters are identical. It's Strong's number 113, Adon. Uh, we, you can think of Adonai. This is very similar to that. And again, we see where God is highlighting in each of these minute details and some that are not so minute in the temple pointing to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can be very, very specific about those details in the manner in which they point to him. Uh, the word also starts with the, the letter, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is Aleph. And Aleph is symbolized by the ox. The ox is actually the word, one of the words for uh, uh, Aleph is the, this word for ox. And we think of the tremendous power and strength of an ox. And also, this would tie into the word for Lord, which also starts with the same first Hebrew letter. And again, the strength of the Lord. And this is what is in view here. Now, we also recognize that if we go to Colossians 1.17, that Christ holds everything together. We even read that earlier in Hebrews 1. But let's go to Colossians 1.17. Colossians 1.17. And he, uh, let's see, okay. Um, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's actually holding everything together. You know, the atom has a positive charge and a negative charge, and they should repel each other, but yet they're being held together. And that is because Christ is the one keeping this entire universe held together and all he has to do is say the word and there goes this entire universe christ is indeed everything was made for him by everything was made for him and by him and he is in control 
of all things. Now, another very highly significant usage of this word socket and one that we might not expect is found in Song of Solomon. Let's go there. Song of Solomon 5. Song of Solomon 5, and I'll read verses 10 through 16. And this word sockets shows up in verse 15. The same word, Strong's number 134. So Song of Solomon 5, 10 through 16. And who is it speaking about? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Well, we can also go to another passage in the Old Testament having to do with the cornerstone, and this is found in Isaiah 28.16. Isaiah 28.16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And here we have two words for stone, and then we have the word for corner. And again, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is also emphasized In the New Testament, if we go to Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, and here we read, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner. The word stone is not in the original. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together, for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Curiously, the word habitation, which is Strong's number 2732, is alluding to the body of Christ. And it's actually only used one other time. And that is in reference to our present world. 
that we are living in now during the day of judgment in which God is ruling the world with a rod of iron. And this is found in Revelation 18.2. And each of these passages are highlighting a kingdom or a nation. The first that I just read in Ephesians 2, in verse 22, is the kingdom of God, the elect who have been brought in to the kingdom of God during the day of salvation. And this second one is our present world, which has become like a graveyard. It's the essence of hell, which is the grave. And there is no hope for these individuals. The only hope that we have is the fact that God, we read about a delay in people understanding what salvation, what God has done to them in salvation prior to May 21, 2011. And so we absolutely do not want to write anybody off to say, oh, this person shows no evidence of salvation. They cannot be saved. We don't know that. We don't know the heart. That's something that only God knows. And this is a very encouraging aspect of God's salvation plan is understanding more about this delay. And, and so there's great hope for our loved ones, for people that we know, uh, that it's not over until it's over. Well, let's go to one last verse where we speak about the the uh, cornerstone in the New Testament, and that is in 1 Peter 2, 6. 1 Peter 2, verse 6. We read there, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. It's, it's really quoting Isaiah 28, 16, which we read earlier. Well, let's continue looking at this word, the first begotten. Uh, I know I did a little detour there about foundation and cornerstone, but I thought that was very important to Keep that in mind as we are discussing the firstborn or the first begotten. And we can turn to Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29. And this is another example of this word, first begotten or firstborn. Romans 8.29. <clears throat> we read there. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And again, we see here that Christ is the firstborn from the dead, or the first begotten from the dead. He rose first. And so everyone else that followed him in salvation rises in their soul when God chose to implement salvation in their life, to apply that salvation that was secured for them at the foundation of the world. And this has been the case all the way up to May 21, 2011. The other thing that we can look at the other passage is in Colossians 1, 15 to 22. <clears throat> Colossians 1, excuse me, 15 to 22. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, 
whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. One last passage we can look at is in Revelation 1, 5. And here we find again the word begotten. <clears throat> Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood or in his own life. Because that's what Christ did at the foundation of the world. He gave up his life. He died. He was annihilated. But he didn't remain in that state of death. He cannot because he is the very essence of eternal life. Well, the last part of verse 6 is the phrase, let all the angels of God worship him. And that is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this phrase consists of four Greek words that only appear together again in the book of Revelation. And this is Revelation 7 specifically. And in Revelation 7, you have two groups of individuals that are in view. You have those that were saved during the era of the church age, which are the 144,000. This is a figurative number. It's not an actual number. It refers to the fullness of the perfection of those that God has saved. And, <clears throat> excuse me, in verses 9 through 17, we read about another group of individuals, and these came out of great tribulation, we read. And these individuals were saved during the period of the latter reign from 1994 to, 20, to 2011, those 17 years where God was penetrating the world with the gospel as never before to reach the nations of the elect. So Revelation 7, 9 through 17. <clears throat> After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. And cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts or creatures, living creatures, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. 
And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So we continue to see the excellency of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ over those of the angelic beings. So number two, we can say that the angelic beings worship Christ at the foundation of the world. Well, I think we'll stop here for today. Lord willing, in our next study, we will venture into verse seven. Unfortunately, as I said at the uh, onset of today's study, we will not be able to have our hymn sing, but we're working to solve that so that, Lord willing, we can start that again next Sunday. Also, please be aware that we will have our question and answer segment later this afternoon at 4.30 Pacific Time, 7.30 Eastern Time, followed by our thematic Bible reading at 6.30 Pacific Time and 9.30 Eastern Time. And as always, we pray that the Lord will continue to bless the rest.